All right, so we're going to go 25 years, 25 minutes, but we need to just start uh, Genesis 17, and then we'll work back. Verse number four, it says, as for me, this is my covenant with you. Uh, God speaking to Abram, you will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, your name will be Abraham, for I've made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. How many people want to be very fruitful? I will make nations of you, kings will come from you, and I'll establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come. That's what we're about, a lasting legacy for generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants. The whole land of Canaan where you are now, you now reside as a foreigner. I'm going to give you that land as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Just come down the page to verse number 15, if you would. It says, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you're no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Verse 17, Abraham fell face down. And he laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? And will you give a son to my wife, Sarah? Will she bear a child at the age of 90? Don't think about this too much. (laughs) Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. The title of the message this morning is part of our vision series. I remember where I sat. It's simply this, you're having a laugh. You're having a laugh. If you're from the South, you might translate as, you're having a laugh, all right? We're going to pray. We're going to get right into it. God, we just thank you for every amazing, unique individual in this place. Each one of us has got a call from God. And we're called to bring a lasting legacy. And I pray you'd help each one of us to look ahead in our life with vision. We'd have dreams God, we'd imagine the great things you want to do in us and through us, and we thank you for this church that you've called us to play our part in, this body, and we pray, God, that over the next few years, we would start to see the things we've only ever dreamt and imagined. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. 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 Well, 10 years ago, my wife uh, walked into the lounge. I was sat down and relaxing. It's what you did before you had kids. <laughs> you sat down and relaxed. Young parents, give me a shout. You know what I'm talking about? Those days are long gone. She came into the lounge. I sat down relaxing, and she was waving a stick at me. I was like, okay, cool. Hey, how's it going? Remember, this is pre-kids, pre-kid like kid and pregnancy and paraphernalia, right? So I'm like, hey, and she's like, it's a baby. And I'm like, you know, I know you think I'm simple and stupid, but that is not a baby. She's like, you're simple, you're stupid. This stick represents we're having a baby. In my head, all that happened at that moment was I heard those famous three notes. Bum, bum, bum. Every, as I, I think I was 28 years old or something around about there. And every 28 year old guy in their head is still 16. Hello. I'm like thinking, what is going on? And so outwardly, I'm like, she wants happy. But inwardly, I'm like, bum, bum, bum. Thinking this is so I gave her some like weird half shot half-smile thing that didn't really get the response she wanted from it. You know, have you ever had a moment where you've been like responded in a way that somebody's like looked and thought, that wasn't the response I was going for? You know, Abraham is there before God. God's speaking to him and God says to him, I'm going to make you the father of nations. And Abraham in his head is like, bum, bum, bum. My wife, Sarah, is 90 years old. We're going to move on quick, right? Just keep talking. He's like, this is 
wrong. What's going on? Is this really going to happen? The reality is many of us, when God speaks to us, we can have that moment of thinking, what are you saying? We can imagine things and dream things and have desires that maybe we think there's, maybe that's God speaking to me. And outwardly, outwardly, like on a Sunday, we're like, God's given me a vision. But inwardly, we're like freaking out. Abraham in this moment is freaking out. His laugh to God was not a response of like, yes, come on, it's going to be amazing. I share this dream. I, I, we're going to, th- this is going to happen. He wasn't excited or anticipating great things in this moment. Abraham is freaking out. I wonder if you've ever been in that place where you've heard something that is so audacious, you're freaking out. Maybe this whole building and this, this offering that we're, we're together bringing, maybe it's like semi-freaking you out or you're thinking, could this really ever happen? Abraham in that moment's like, I just don't know what's going to go, what's going to happen here. But what we see over 25 years is God continually layers the word, speaking to Abraham, layers it again, speaks again, and he keeps reassuring him of the promise that is made to him. What I've found is when often when God speaks to me, we don't get an answer the next day, right? It's not like you put your prayer request in the magic prayer wall, and instantly on Monday morning, you're like, oh. often there's a process Who knows, between believing God's spoken to you, praying, and it actualizing in real life. Honest people, give me a shout. See, you could be here and you've been walking through certain things in your life, but carrying on one hand, I've got this word, this dream, this vision from God, but evidently I see absolutely nothing. I guess in a sense, like Abraham was, Your response to God is to roll around laughing and say, God, you're having a laugh. What we see over these 25 years of God speaking to Abraham is not only is God reassuring Abraham, but also God is testing Abraham. I want you to know today that God does not set up tests for you to catch you out. He sets up tests for you to set you up. God, when he speaks to us, when he promises something to us, when he gives us a hope, when he gives us a future, when he gives you a desire in your heart, God will test you, but his test is not to catch you out, it's to set you up. And so we're going to rewind 25 years and just have a look how when God speaks to Abraham and confirms his promise over and over again, what he also does is conveniently set up a test for Abraham to pass because he wants Abraham to steward the fulfillment of the promise in the best possible way. That's God's commitment to you. His heart to you is to set you up so that you can carry what he's put on your heart to the best of your ability. And so we're going to rewind and look, first of all, the first time God speaks to Abraham is in Genesis chapter 12. Would you just rewind in your Bibles, just a couple of flicks, or if you've got actual Bibles with pages on, come on, let's keep it old school. Genesis chapter 12, the Lord said to Abraham in verse 1, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household, to the land I will show you. Go, leave your people, leave your country, leave your household. Don't worry about the details, I need you to go. Verse 2, I'll make you a great nation, I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. The first time God clearly speaks to Abraham, and what I want you to note here is Abraham is 75 years old. Some people freak out when they don't see anything at 25 years of age. 
Abraham's 75 and God is speaking to him as recorded for the first time. Abraham's like, wow, God, your voice to me is moving me beyond where I'm at. This is a dream, a vision, an idea. This is something that's burning in my heart. Maybe, God, you're speaking to me. But I'm just nowhere near that right now. The promise was a promise to be fulfilled, but it was only the start of a 25-year journey. You see, what test God was bringing to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, the very first time he gives him this picture, this dream, this idea, is the step of obedience. The test of obedience. He says, God, Abraham, here's the promise, but what I need you to do is to leave your country. Leave your comfort zone. Leave what's familiar to you. When you wake up in the morning, you have that test every single morning to leave your comfort zone. You may have a dream and an idea to get in physical shape, but if you press snooze, it's not going to happen. You see, dreams, visions, ideas happen in the place of comfort often, but the fulfillment never happens while you're still in bed. There has to be a point where you step out of your comfort zone and you go for that run, you go to the gym, you do what you need to do to fulfill that, what, that which you feel is on your heart to do. And Abraham, God speaks to Abram and says, I want you to be the father of many nations. I'm gonna, you're going to be a blessing to, to nations. I, I'm going to use you to make a, a real difference. But Abraham, the first thing I'm going to test you with is are you willing to step outside of your comfort zone? Verse 4, it says, so Abraham went as the Lord told him. Simply, I wonder, what is it that God is saying to you? What is the vision, the dream, the idea? What is the thing that God has for you? What, what's the thing that you're saying, wow, I feel like God has got me on the planet for this reason, to make a difference in, in this gateway, in this area of society. God's got me here for a reason. What is it that God said to you? But the second and maybe most important thing is what is your response to that word going to be? What are you going to do about it? We can all say, wow, what an incredible dream for this building that we, we've got an image for. We can see in our mind's eye, God, we can see how justice will, will flow out from this building. This cathedral in Manchester that's going to be a resource center for other churches, for, for, uh, for business people, for education, for, for people who need a safe place. This building, we can see it, God. God, you've clearly spoken to us. But the second thing is, what's your response going to be? God says for each one of us, if we're going to see what we see in our mind's eye become a reality, every single one of us has to step outside of our comfort zone. You know what happens as soon as you make that step outside your comfort zone? Every step into a new place that's outside your familiar sets up a new, a new habitat. The Bible says in verse number 7 of Genesis chapter 12, this land will not only be for you, but it will be for your offspring. This will be for future generations. This land will be the territory of your descendants. Whenever you make a step outside your comfort zone, you not only make a difference in your own life, but you create a new reality for the next generation. Every one of us understands in the natural, the principle of inheritance is somebody steps into something through no act of their own, but by simply being part of the family tree. They step into a new territory, a new habitat. And the same is true in your connection by being grafted in to the people of God. We step into a new inheritance. 
We step into Abraham's promise of being a blessing, being a blessing, being blessed so that we can bless others. We step into a new territory, not because of what we've done, but simply because of our family tree. And the same is true when you step outside your comfort zone. The next generation is completely transformed. Whatever I decide to do in my life, me and my wife Emily understand this principle, wherever we go in our life becomes the normal for Jasmine, Zachariah, and Ezekiel. They won't even question the things that for us are a step of faith. They're just normal territory for them. They won't even have to think or believe for the things that we've been praying for. It'll just be normal. But the test will come one day for them is to make the next step outside of their comfort zone. Because what was faith for me is just normal for Jasmine. And the same should be true for each one of us if we want to set up a new normal for the next generation in this city and beyond, then we are going to have to step outside of our comfort zone. Come on, would you leave your place of comfort? Would you leave your family and say, come on, not for me, but on behalf of future generations, I'm going to make a step. I'm going to make a step. The first test that we have is the test of obedience. The second test is found in Genesis chapter 13 when God speaks to Abraham a second time. In Genesis chapter 13, verse number 14, it says, God said to Abraham after Lot, his nephew, had gone with him, had parted from him, look around from here where you are, to the north, the south, the east, the west, all the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. This is the second time. God is speaking to him. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of this land, because I am giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. Just before this moment in Genesis chapter 13, the promise is reconfirmed from Genesis 12, a chapter later, to Abraham. The same promise I'm going to give you this land. Abraham, you've proved yourself in the first test. You've made the step up and you've stepped out in obedience. And so now you find yourself here. I'm going to give you this land. But this second test was now here. Because just before Genesis 13, Abraham and his nephew Lot had been stood in their new place. Their new place of faith that was now going to become familiar to them. That God was giving to them. And their people, there's a little bit of discord, and God spoke to Abraham, and he said, come on, just let Lot go and have the best of the land. And so he offers, Lot, you can go right. If you go right, then I'll just take this stuff. I'll take left. But if you take left, then I'll just take right. You have first dibs. You've got first pick. You pick the best of the land, because I know that God... Whatever he gives to me is going to be all good. It's going to be good. And so he lets Lot with his people go and take the best of the land. This test was real. Abraham had stepped out in obedience, but this second test was a test of motivation. In other words, why are you doing what you are doing? Abraham, you've stepped in this land, but you're going to keep this land if your motivation is pure and if you've got a clean heart. And so he tests him by saying, would you let somebody else have first pick? What happens is Lot leaves him, and then he goes and gets himself in trouble just after this promise. Abraham could have looked at Lot and goes, well, that serves you right. You shouldn't have left me. You had the best of the land, and now you're in trouble. You deal with the consequences of your actions. And yet the test for Abraham was, would he allow someone to be released and keep his heart pure and say, even if he finds himself in trouble, I'm going to go and rescue him. And so in the middle of this second time, God speaks a promise to him. Abraham is tested, would you go and rescue Lot? A test of motivation. The reason you've got this land, is this really about blessing people? I wonder what your dream is really all about. 
I wonder if you were to be really honest with yourself, with God, and ask yourself, God, why do I have this desire? Why do I have this dream? Why do I have this hope? Why do I have this vision? What is it really all about? Have you ever really asked yourself that question? Because I don't know about you, but maybe it's just for me. There's often things in my life that I say, I want. And the temptation can be to spiritualize that thing. To say, oh, God said. Does that make it okay now? You know? You can tend to like attach some scripture. You're like, right, I've got to find a verse to attach to my dream. Because then I can say, God clearly said. I wonder if you've ever really challenged yourself. Why do I have this dream? What is this all about? Because Abraham, in receiving a promise from God, was tested to see if his heart was clean. Remember, the test is not to catch you out. The test is to set you up. And so God knew if if Abraham's going to have this land, he's going to have to have a clean and pure heart. He's going to have to be, because he's going to be blessed. And if his heart's not right, he'll think it's all about him. But if his heart's right, he'll understand that blessing is just for him to be a conduit, to be a blessing to others. That's not why you should never judge somebody else who you say, wow, they've got a lot. They're so blessed in life. Because maybe the reason they're so blessed in life is because they've come through this test of motivation where they don't actually care about the blessing. The only reason they have the blessing is to bless others. So Abraham was tested. Would you look out for the needs of others even when I bless you? The second test that you're going to face if you're carrying a dream, a vision from God is the test of motivation. Quickly, the third time God speaks to Abraham is in chapter 15 and verse number 3. It says, Abraham said, you've given me no children, God, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up at the sky, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. I love this. God brings Abraham outside of his comfort zone. He brings him outside and he says, come on, let's just dream for a few moments. Let's imagine for a few moments. Abraham, just for a few moments, stop looking here and start to lift up your eyes and look up. Look up. Look at the stars. In preparing this message, I just really felt that God over this next two weeks is going to cause you to have a greater imagination and creative thoughts are going to come as you create space in your diary to not just look everything here, but to give yourself a moment to lift up your eyes, that God's going to say, come on, let's look up together, look at the stars. Look at future generations. And over the next two weeks, God is going to give you creative ideas. He's going to give you pictures. He's going to give you thoughts. He's going to give you imaginations. You're going to begin to see Manchester in a completely different way. As we say, God, get me outside. See, the test here was, uh, do you trust God? Because in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is getting a little bit restless. God has spoken to him not once, not twice, but three times. He's saying, God, how many times do you want to say the same thing? Like, God, are you just like this God that creates a vision, a picture, an idea, a dream, and you're totally unable to fulfill on your promise? God, you're over-promising and very much under-delivering. So Abraham says, do you need me to give you a hand? So he speaks to his wife, and his wife comes up with an incredible idea. Take our maidservant, and Abraham's like, that's a great idea. 
And so a son is birthed that is not the promise, called Ishmael. Abraham's 86 years old. He's been waiting for 11 years, and God has delivered nothing on the promise. And so the third test Abraham is faced with is, are you just going to try and make this dream happen on your own strength, or are you going to trust me? I wonder if you've ever done that. I'm sure you guys haven't. The guys in Chester always do this. You know, when you've had a dream, you've had an idea, you've had a vision, and you can see where it should go, the natural progression of things. And so you've just tried to help God out with placing yourself in the right place, and just positioning yourself, having the right conversations. The tragedy of many of those situations is what you're doing is birthing an Ishmael when the promise is that God wants to do something completely miraculous. In your life, God does not need you to help him out. God is able to fulfill on his word. He's able to fulfill the promise. I don't know what it would be for you, but wherever God is speaking to you about, and you're saying, my test right now is to trust God. What is the action for you you need to start doing or you need to stop doing that represents a new level of trust in the nature, the character, and the power of the promises of God in your life? I'm not just going to birth an Ishmael. I want God to do this. See, in building this building and seeing God do something amazing here, there's our next step as a church. What we're saying is, God, we're in unfamiliar territory. We're in miracle zone. God, only you can do this right now. And as each one of us steps up and just plays our part, even maybe the sum of all of our parts in the logical doesn't kind of, the maths doesn't work, and yet, If each one of us comes and says, come on, we're going to do everything we can do, then God will do what only he can do. God's promise that it's not going to happen through Hagar. It's going to happen through Sarah. The promise is going to be fulfilled through my power. We need the miraculous power of God. I wonder if today you'd say, God, I'm going to put my trust in you again. The fourth time God comes to Abraham is in Genesis 17. From Genesis chapter 16 to Genesis chapter 17 is 14 years. And you think you're waiting. 24 years has passed and God speaks to Abraham again in Genesis 17 verse 1 says, Hey, remember that word 14 years ago that I'd spoke 11 years before that? Still going to happen. Do you know what, Abraham, I've been watching you. And for the last 14 years, we had that little, you know, that that patch. Didn't go great. We threw that. For 14 years, you've been believing. You've been believing. And watch what I'm about to do. He speaks to Abraham and Sarah and says, in the next 12 months, you will have a son. Abraham falls about, we read it in the star, face down, rolling around the floor, laughing, saying, God. One time maybe he'd been laughing in faith, going, God, isn't this amazing? But now, 24 years later, Abraham's laugh is not a laugh of excitement. It's a laugh of fear, doubt, wondering, faithlessness. (laughs) God, that is absolutely ridiculous. Abraham's response to God is, God, you're having a laugh. You're having a laugh. God says, in the next 12 months, you're going to have a son. And you are going to name him Isaac. Simply means God. He laughs. In other words, he's saying, you may be laughing, thinking this is never going to happen. Yeah, you know who's going to have the last laugh. When you're holding your son Isaac in your hands, you're going to recognize God always has the last laugh. God always 
has the last laugh. Sarah said in Genesis 21, as she holds a promise, she says, God, you've brought laughter to my house. And I sense in the next 12 months that God is going to bring a new laughter to your house. God's going to release a new joy in your house. God is going to release dreams and visions and ideas that once you were saying with excitement, yes, God, but now you've found yourself disillusioned, disappointed, wondering, and you've found yourself today in that place going, God, you're having a laugh. Yet God's saying in the next 12 months, you watch who's going to have the last laugh. God is bringing new laughter to your house. If you would just once again say, God, I believe, I believe. I'm going to pass the test of trust. I'm going to put my full confidence, my full faith in you. You see my heart is clean. It's pure. My motive is for others. I'm going to take the step of obedience. What's God saying to you this morning? Most importantly today is, what are you going to do about that word?